Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Linda Isaacson, and welcome to today's EMSA Learn webinar. Well, we will be discussing um, isotope analysis capabilities at EMSL. We are so glad that you could join us today. The next webinar will happen on June 14th, and it will focus on the topics for the upcoming exploratory call opening this month. If you're interested in submitting a proposal for the exploratory call, make sure to attend. And more information will be provided on our social media channels and as well as uh, via email for all of our upcoming events and opportunities. Uh, make sure to keep in touch with EMSL by subscribing to our email and social media channels. If you haven't already, the links will be provided in the chat. So for today, EMSL biologist Amir Akami will provide an overview of EMSL's capabilities for monitoring carbon and nutrient flux in biological systems, specifically in the rhizosphere. Sophie Lehman will explain how you can leverage EMSL's multiple isotope ratio mass spectrometry, uh, or IRMS, capabilities to accelerate your rhizosphere research. Jim Moran will walk you through how he used laser ablation IRMS to study carbon exchange in microbial mats and switchgrass. And John Cliff will discuss how nanoscale secondary ion mass spectrometry can be used for imaging isotopes. There will be time at the end of today's webinar for questions. We encourage you to post your questions in the Zoom chat and Amir, Sophie, Jim, and John will answer them during the Q&A portion following their presentations. So with that, we will begin with Amir. Yeah, hi everyone. Uh, thanks, Linda. Uh, just trying to take the control. Yeah, I think now it works. Awesome. Um, okay, hello everybody. Um, my name is Amir Ahkami. I'm a, I'm a MSOL uh, scientist. And uh, what I'm trying to do today in the first uh, portion of this webinar is just uh, to give you an, uh, an uh, overall view, high level view of, uh, of the use of isotope labeling uh, capabilities and uh, sciences that related to these capabilities to track nutrient flow um, uh, in the rhizosphere uh, area. So for those who are not uh, actually familiar uh, with EMSL, uh, I should say that EMSL is a DOE user uh, facility, offers world-class capabilities for a user community across three specific research areas in environmental science, in biological science, and computing. And these specific science areas are supported by a set of multidisciplinary scientific and technical domains, which are called Integrated Research Platforms, or IRPs. Uh, which are actually listed here in, in three rows under each uh, science areas. And then each uh, science area and related IRPs are following and addressing specific strategic objectives like the GFN, Monet, or MDS, which I'm not going to actually discuss all of those, uh, but I'm sure uh, Linda and our communication uh, staff actually provide uh, related links uh, for all of you to get more information. But regarding isotope labeling approaches and science areas and questions related to that, um, actually these capabilities are applicable uh, and used uh, in many of these uh, uh, integrated research platforms and science areas. But our today's focus is mainly on, on the rhizosphere uh, function uh, integrated research uh, platform. Um, so, as you probably know, rhizosphere is one of the most complex systems uh, in the world, uh, which is uh, comprised of an inter integrated network of, of plant roots, soil, and diverse microbial uh, consortium. Uh, oh, I think I, sorry, it's, uh, okay. Here we go. So here is a snapshot or a high level description of the rhizosphere function uh, integrated research uh, platform um, where we investigate the molecular mechanisms of root soil micro interactions and the effects of root control processes, including rhizodeposition uh, on below ground carbon flux, biogeochemical nutrient cycling, plant resilience, and microbial community structure and, and, uh, and function. 
So a specific focus here is, is uh, to study the rhizosphere processes in response to environmental perturbations like uh, drought, heat, and uh, salinity. Just to give you uh, a bit more of, uh, of context uh, here, um, so I just uh, have, a, have a figure of interactions in the rhizosphere. And clearly, rhizosphere significantly impacts carbon flow and, and transformation. So the main carbon fluxes between uh, different carbon pools within the plant soil microorganism systems are, are actually shown here. This blue arrows here shows uh, the, uh, the transformation of substances to soil organic uh, uh, carbon. Uh, the light uh, blue arrows actually shows the uh, shows the, the carbon emission or losses through CO two emissions uh, through the the, the the shoot or root um, respirations or microbial respirations, and uh, this green arrow actually shows the microbial recycling. So, in order to understand such uh, complex uh, system and interactions, we can measure the spatial and, and temporal changes in the labeled carbon 13 to carbon 12 ratio of each carbon pool, um, uh, which could potentially quantify carbon allocation uh, and pattern and dynamics and also carbon turnover. Uh, also, we can distinguish the uh, soil organic matter sources and eventually clarify important rhizosphere uh, interactions. So some similar uh, uh, scenario actually is in place regarding other nutrients like nitrogen, which is the major nutrient uh, limiting plant growth in, in, in terrestrial ecosystems. Uh, and as you may know, the transformation of inert nitrogen uh, to, to the forms that are accessible and the, the ones that can be assimilated by plants uh, is, is controlled by soil microorganisms. So there are several types of symbiosis between plant roots and microorganisms to improve the nitrogen uh, nutrition. Uh, uh, by plants in the rhizosphere. Um, so plants can also increase nitrogen conservation in soil by limiting microbial processes that lead to nitrogen losses. So again here, it is critically important to have the capabilities to spatially track uh, nitrogen in the rhizosphere region. And it would be very informative. And um, of course, one uh, major approach here uh, is to, uh, to do nitrogen li uh, labeling uh, using N15 approach uh, that we can uh, actually to track nitrogen using specific capabilities like nanoseams, which you will hear more today uh, later uh, from uh, John Cleese. Um, so in EMSO, we have um, different type of capabilities um, for monitoring carbon and nutrient fluxes at, uh, in, the, in the rhizosphere. Uh, so we do use a uh, SIP or stable isotope probing approach uh, in which a substrate is enriched uh, with, a, with a heavier a stable isotope that is consumed by uh, organisms, can be plants or microbes to be tracked and, and studied. Uh, then we use integrated omics for metabolic flux analysis um, or even NMR. We have uh, really great NMR capabilities in place. Um, for the samples that are not easily accessible, for example, organic matter analy analysis in, in soil, uh, so NMR is very sensitive to isotopes, as you know, uh, but, you know, uh, we, the soil, soil state NMR can be also used to, um, to track isotopes into plant and fungal cell walls. But the major focus of today's webinar, of course, is not NMR, but we'll have some specific webinars in the near future, hopefully, on that topical area. Um, today, we're actually mainly uh, focusing on, uh, on isotope ratio mass spectrometry, or IRMS, for bulk isotope analysis, uh, which you will hear more from Sophie. But it is also specifically important to spatially track and determine the, the labeled um, uh, isotope um, uh, the, uh, and, and the compounds or, or not nutrients. And for that, we have a specific capabilities like laser ablation or LAIRMS, which you will hear more from Jim Moran today, and, and, and nanoseams, uh, which you'll hear more uh, uh, from John later today. So as I mentioned in EMSOL, we have uh, uh, plant growth uh, facilities. Uh, we have Phytotron that is equipped with different plant growth chambers, which we can grow plants under controlled condition. We have a great team, of course, to work with. Um, so uh, some of these chambers are equipped with carbon labeling boxes, which we can actually inject the uh, labeled carbon as kind of CO2. 
to, and then track it uh, by, by different capabilities that I mentioned, like integrated omics or NMR, IRMS, and, and, and especially uh, resolve techniques like uh, LARMS, IRMS, or, or Maristics. Um, so I just, in my last slide, I'm just going to highlight one recent study that we actually use in integrated IRMS and metabolomics approaches to identify novel carbon drivers uh, in roots. Uh, so I just briefly go over this study. You know, the ability of root tissue to import carbon from leaves is critically important for biomass productivity. But we don't know that much about the molecular drivers that are involved in this process. Uh, so auxin is a major phytohormone in plant system that actually regulate the photoassimilate uh, transport and, uh, from source to sink tissue. Um, so in this study, we treated, we treated plants with auxin modulators uh, to understand the molecular processes involved in the long distance sourcing carbon allocation in poplar. So we treated plants with auxin enhanced certain inhibitors and we measured phenotypic parameters uh, and we did molecular analysis using metabolomics and transcriptomics. And we consequently observed you know, changes with phenotypes at tissue and molecular levels. So to further evaluate whether these phenotypic and molecular changes were due to uh, photosynthate transfer or carbon transfer from source to sink tissues, we, 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 we did a, a CO2 um, a tracer experiment, carbon-13 experiment in different segments of roots uh, as a sink or as you see here in root top, in the root middle and in root tip. And uh, as you see in this red rows uh, that, you know, under oxygen enhancement condition, we, we did see and observe the higher concentration of carbon levels uh, in, in the sink organs, uh, which actually, in, this is kind of an, an indication that the photoassimilars actually are uh, mainly transported from source to sink tissue under oxygen enhanced condition. Um, so uh, in conclusion, in this study, we um, actually we integrated uh, phenotypic transcriptomics and metabolomics data and the data from carbon labeling approach. And we postulated a model, uh, as you see here, that suggests uh, the sourcing carbon relationships in poplar could be fueled by specific metabolites like sugar alcohols or TCA cycle uh, intermediates as key molecular drivers um, that are involved in importing carbon from shoot to uh, below ground. So overall, the carbon labeling and IRMS uh, technology is really powerful, particularly when there are integrated with uh, you know, omics studies, uh, omics uh, capabilities like uh, transcriptomics or metabolomics that I uh, mentioned here. Um, so I think I should stop here um, and thank you all. And I'm happy to pass the stage to Sophie. Hi, everyone. Thank you for coming today. I'm going to talk today a bit about you know, some background about the light stable isotopes, some of the capabilities we have in EMSL that you might be interested in applying to your work, and then some research that is broadly within the environmental sciences that apply stable isotopes that hopefully will um, inspire you in your rise of sphere work. Some types of questions that might be interesting are flux quantification, metabolic processes, uh, what specific organisms are involved, what organisms are consuming, um, for example, specific tracer, and what are they doing with it? And then spatial localization of processes. So most elements have multiple isotopes. So this is a constant number of protons, but different number of neutrons. And isotopes can be stable or radioactive. Here, we're really considering only you know, our light, stable, uh, low mass elements. Specifically in our lab, we tend to look at carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and hydrogen. And for each of these elements, we have a, a light isotope, stable isotope, and a heavy stable isotope. And really for all of these, 
the average natural, natural abundance is much, much greater for our light stable isotope than the heavy stable isotope. Heavy stable isotopes behave almost like their lighter versions. And what this means is that most biological, chemical, physical processes very have a very small shift in their isotope con um, composition. We can use instruments in the lab, in our lab here, that are very sensitive to changes in isotope ratios to help understand some of these different processes. How we do this is usually in two different ways. We can look at measurements of natural isotope distributions, and then we can artificially label or artificially add an isotope um, or a trace, like a label, and see how that isotope then propagates through a system. Call it tracer, label, um, SIP, as Amir had mentioned. The amount of each isotope on Earth is fixed. However, there is a wide distribution of isotopes in the natu national, natural distribution. Here we're looking at carbon isotopes. And as you see, lots of different organisms have different ranges in the carbon isotopes. Um, we tend to think of, car of, of light stable isotopes and talk about them in terms of delta notation. This is essentially looking at the heavy to light ratio of an element and comparing that to the heavy light and light ratio of the element to a standard. So a sample compared to a standard. In this case, we're looking at carbon 13 to 12 of the sample versus that of the standard. With our stable isotopes, the typical measurement precision and accuracy tends to be around 0 0.1 to 0 0.5 per mil. And what does this mean? This correlates to measuring a change that can be as little as 0.001%. Um, 13C. The natural variability of our isotope ratios can be related to physical processes. So in this figure, we're looking at continental U.S. and we're looking at oxygen isotopes or delta 18O of precipitation across the continental U.S. And Warmer colors have more 18O. Cooler colors have less 18O in that water. If you draw your attention to the Pacific Northwest, as we go from the coast inland, you see that we have um, lighter quickly. We have in a very like a short distance, we have lighter oxygen isotopes in our precipitation. And this is because we're quickly moving up elevation from the coast to the Cascade Mountains. And our heavy isotopes of oxygen fall out closer to the coast, leaving us with more of the lighter oxygen, our 16O. Variability can also be related to chemical and biochemical processes. So for example, how plants utilize CO2. In this figure, we're looking at the carbon isotope ratio, or delta 13C, of different types of plants. So C3 plants and C4 plants utilize, or they have different photosynthetic pathways. And what this means in isotope space is that C4 plants like corn will look different and are distinct really from our C3 plants, um, such as wheat and barley. So stable isotope concentrations can be quantified by different methods, different instruments. Um, we're going to look at um, spectroscopy and mass spectrometry instruments. Mass spectrometry instruments we tend to call IRMS. Spectroscopy systems have a similar performance to IRMS. Um, even though this is, well, this is true, you can really only analyze one 
analyte at a time. So in this case, in our lab, we look we can look at water on our instrument. What's very neat about this kind of instrument is that it can be deployed in the field. And it's it takes up a small amount of space and it's fairly easy to run. IRMS systems are really what got stabilized tope analyses off the ground. These are more flexible in terms of what um, samples we are looking at. So we can look at CO2 or N2, for example. And basically, we can look at different masses. These instruments need a stable lab environment. And we can only look at gases. So we can't look at water like we could in the example before. Essentially, how this works is that a, your gas goes into the IRMS, it's ionized, it's then accelerated along this flight tube, it's under vacuum, passes through a magnet, and at the end, your molecules with heavier isotopes, like 13 CO2, are separated from your molecules with your light isotopes, like 12 CO2. I'm going to talk now about some of the capabilities that we have at EMSL here and you know, highlight a few projects. So in this work, scientists were interested in differentiating rates of activity using an isotope tracer and spectroscopic isotope analyses. To do this, or and they're looking at different media. Uh, with different types of trace metals. And to do this, um, heavy hydrogen was added to media. And then this was measured for oxidation of hydrogen to water. If you look at the plot here, you have molecules of hydrogen converted to water on the y-axis. And we're looking at two different strains under two different conditions, so in two different uh, or in different media. And in both cases, we see that in condition one, there's a lot more activity happening than in condition two. We can attach peripheral devices to facilitate introduction of liquids and solids into the IRMS. This in includes heat and catalysts, as well as acid digestion. Elemental analyzers can be coupled to an IRMS for typical analysis of solid samples. So this can this gives us a bulk isotope value. Everything in your sample is combusted and you get one isotope value from that sample. Um, a method or a study that used this method um, put labeled CO2 into environmental chamber and then harvested the rhizosphere and soil from plants. What they saw was that in drought conditions, this labeled carbon remained within the rhizosphere and very little of it made its way into the bulk soil. Gas chromatography coupled to IRMS can be used for compound specific isotope analysis. So instead of having one isotope value for a sample, this method can pull different compounds in your sample apart, and you can get an isotope value for each different compound. A study that utilized this method used 13C bicarbonate as a tracer to follow autotrophic and heterotrophic um, substrate incorporation of microbe-produced amino acids. So if you look at this figure here, you have a series of different amino acids with delta 13C on the y axis. And what we, and it's looking at the labeled carbon over a two day period. What we see is that different amino acids um, are turning over this carbon faster than others. The gas bench can be coupled to an IRMS, and this can allow us to analyze carbonates and different dissolved compounds. And this works by adding acid to your sample and heating it, and then looking at CO2. A study that utilized this method was 
using delta H, you know, of otolis as a proxy for a thermal history of, an, of a fish, individual fish, and to gather information on uh, geographic origin. So in this study, the researchers looked at otolis. These are fish ear bones. And in this image here, you can see these fish ear bones grow over time in rings, much like a tree grows in rings over time. And what they did was they raised fish in different temperatures of water, very distinct temperatures, and then harvested these ear bones. They then analyzed the delta HNO of those ear bones, which are made of carbonate. And what we see is a very linear relationship with temperature and delta HNO. This these studies are really um, you know, very helpful to continuing the effort to preserve salmon in the area, as well as to track how nutrients transfer from marine to terrestrial systems. Laser ablation is another capability we have here, and it's coupled to the IRMS. This can be useful for a spatially resolved 13C determination. This is an in-house developed technique, which you'll hear a lot more about in the following talk by Jim Moran. Um, this is something he, he designed. In this image, you see these spots. Each spot is related to a laser pulse, the rhizosphere going um, next to a root. And this can be used for constraining localization of root extrudates to determine scale and rhizosphere response to perturbation. So if you're interested in utilizing light-stable isotopes in our facilities here, please reach out and we can talk about, you know, the project, some of tips and troubleshooting when designing experiments. For example, you know, how much is going to be too much tracer material? And from here, I'd like to introduce Jim Moran. Great, thank you very much, Sophie. And I, I just have to um, almost ask for apologies um, first because I'm seeing some of these questions come in in the chat and it's like, I wanna get sidetracked and, and just start uh, talking about those. But instead, why don't we see if we can um, get going and I wanna just take us through a few examples uh, of how you can use laser ablation IRMS provide a little bit of background on you know, how we sort of cobble this together, what it can do, what it can, uh, uh, what processes hopefully it can inform. So, so as we get started, I think you know, take a deep breath, contemplate the world as a whole, and, and think about what you see. We know that there's a lot of processes, physical, chemical, biological things that are happening all over, but there's some general principles that we can also see. For instance, a lot of these processes happen a little bit faster at interfaces in a spatial orientation, right? Here, there's a picture of, of the globe. Certainly, uh, a lot of processes happen more quickly uh, on co in coastal regions than maybe in the interior. That's that's one example, not necessarily pertinent to what we're thinking about, but, it, but still an example. But if you delve a little bit more closely, we know other things, right? Mineral grains are more prone to weathering along their boundary, along the edge. Maybe you're an ecologist and you think about the interface, the spatial connection between a field and a forest, maybe harboring a little bit more uh, biodiversity than either a, a field or a forest on its own. But of course, one of the things that we're also really focusing on is rhizosphere, right? One of these most brilliant and is, as Amir said, more complex uh, systems in the world where you have this great juxtaposition of plant and soil and they're so mixed together that they become neither one. Instead, that interface becomes rhizosphere, right? And there's so much happening there. It's so spatially constrained to just millimeters that we felt like we needed a tool to help pull apart some of the, the nutrient exchange processes that are actually going, actually occurring there. A tool that was compatible with other techniques because we know that no one technique is gonna help us pull apart everything that's going on, but a tool that would give us um, some information that could help us interpret other forms of data. And it was that with that inspiration that we turned to laser ablation IRMS. And if I can make the video work, it's always a big if with me. But you see here, unfortunately not roots, but this is actually a hair. 
And what you might have seen in the middle, uh, a few flashes, um, and then a hole uh, develops, right? What we're doing is we're taking a laser and ablating that hair. That's actually a human hair. It's very fine. And we're making a approximately a 50 micron diameter hole in that hair. That's something that you can see. But the really exciting thing is what you can't see. Because what you can't see is as that laser is ablating that surface, it's converting the hair into nanometer, tens of nanometer sized particles. See, these particulates we then take, pass through a combustion uh, reactor and effectively burn them to CO2. We can then take that CO2 and pass it to the IRMS and get very fine scale quantification of the, the amount of 13C that came from that hair where, where we ablated it. Now, I, I should mention that this whole process you heard me mention, you know, the whole process, you ablate it and, and you make these particulates. Very little of that requires any fancy preparation of your sample, right? So basically what we need to do, the hardest part in taking a sample is actually harvesting that sample without perturbing any of the spatial orientation. Here, there's a, you can see an example here of, of a plant, this one grown in a rhizo box, just a schematic. But you can pull out a plug of that soil we rotate it, and here you can, you can see the roots. We dry it. We don't want water in the sample because that can interfere uh, with our analysis, our, the laser ablation and, and IRMS analyses. But then we take it, we put it into an ablation chamber, and we're ready to, to hit it with that laser and ablate it. And, you know, there's, there's a little bit of, you know, Sophie mentioned that we sort of cobbled this, this together. Really, we didn't make a laser ablation system and we didn't make an IRMS system, what we made is this interface uh, to connect the two, right? So you can put your sample in the laser ablation system, make CO2, pass that to, to the IRMS. We're taking the best of both worlds and merging them together so we can get spatial resolved sampling with the quantification ability of that IRMS. And here's just another example. This is also a hair, um, I believe this one was a horse hair, but you can see these nice 50 micron uh, diameter uh, spots, things like hair, nice polymer, a lot of or, uh, organic carbon. We can get 50 microns or in some cases even better uh, spatial resolution. If we start moving towards soil uh, samples, there's a lot less carbon. So it takes more sample to get enough uh, material to make that IRMS measurement. And for that, we end up making about a 100 micron uh, a spot size or, or sort of ablation size in that sample. So most of the time we think about spatial resolution to, to provide a spatially resolved data. Before we move on to some other examples, I want to just give one example where that spatial is actually tied to temporal patterns, right? And I, I've shown a couple slides now of hairs. This will be the last slide of, uh, where I mentioned hair, I promise. But you can see here um, the distance along a hair segment here in millimeters uh, has different uh, values in the 13C measurement, whether that's the human hair or a horse hair. We can also say that horse hairs, um, this one from Texas, has a little bit more 13C uh, than a horse hair uh, uh, that we sampled much closer to, to P and L. Um, and that was due to the, the dominant vegetation type. Again, that, that C3, C4 variation uh, that Sophie mentioned in her slides. But you can also see these, these differences within a human. And if you think of a human, sometimes we eat C3 dominated diet, sometimes C4, sometimes it changes uh, meal to meal. And with, with the laser ablation approach, we're getting spatial resolution that can really track uh, daily patterns, right? So usually a human hair doesn't grow more than say 50 microns, 100 microns a day, something like that. And so we're able to make these spatially resolved measurements that can effectively capture roughly a day's worth of, of diet for the human. And I, I think that's why you're seeing uh, some of this variability in the data, which is much, much larger variability than we're seeing from the system it, itself. So moving on, I don't want to take too much time, but I do want to show a few uh, different examples of where we've used laser ablation IRMS to help us understand some environmentally relevant processes. The first example comes from Yellowstone National Park. You might uh, notice Mushroom Spring is on the, the slide on the right here. Hydrothermal system in, in the Norris, or not in, the, in uh, excuse me, Lower Geyser Basin, not too far from Old Faithful. 
One of the reasons I think this is such a famous spring in my mind is that uh, Brock did a lot of work here and I actually isolated one of the strains of Thermus aquaticus from the system, which of course uh, is where we get TAC polymerase, and which gave rise to you know, PCR and, and in effect the genomic revolution. We were there to do some sampling looking at different types of problems. We took some microbial mat, as you can see here on the left, and you might see these really nice colorations, you know, green on top, and then uh, sort of a reddish band, white band, and then, and then a deeper red sort of under, underneath that. We wanted to ask, how does autotrophically derived carbon get into the mats? These mats are, are below the thermal maximum for photosynthesis. We know that there's various uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms present in the system. We want to just ask the question, okay, well, where is photosynthesis happening? And we also wanted to ask a question, who is doing the photosynthesis at these different uh, um, layers in the mat? So to do that, we took these mats and these vials that you can see on the left, we added a 13C labeled bicarbonate, and then we incubated uh, uh, these mat segments under different light conditions under full light, and then also under light uh, conditions where we subtracted you know, um, different components of that light, meant to see if we could um, sort of activate autotrophy, the photoautotrophic processes within different uh, uh, bands in, in these mats. So I'm gonna talk about the laser ablation data on the right, but first we can look at, what, at the bulk data. So this is a, a piece of the mat. We went in and we took a razor blade. We just said, okay, this is this is pretty crude, but let's take this razor blade, chop the top, the middle, and the bottom of the mat off. And with that 13C label, we're seeing a lot of that tracer in the in the upper green layer of the mat. You know, uh, plus 1300 uh, per mil. The middle shows a drop in that label, plus 130 per mil. And the bottom shows minimal uptake of that 13C tracer into the biomass of the mat. We then did the laser ablation of the same sample. We tried to align roughly, I didn't scale it perfectly, but the top uh, zero millimeters through the mat is that upper surface. And then we go deeper and deeper into the mat as we go down that Y axis. On the X axis, you can see the isotope value, right? So you see very similar to what you expect towards the surface of the mat. There's more incoming light, more photons. As you go deeper into the mat, it gets darker right, because the mat's shading itself, and we're seeing this decrease in the 13C tracer, indicating a decrease uh, incorporation of that bicarbonate through, through phototrophy uh, into the mat system. Now, this, this example on the right, that's full light when we hit the mat with, with unfiltered light, but if we filter the light, right, so the, on the left now, these green markers are if we take visible light and subtract the blue light from it, and then the pink magenta markers are just if we let the infrared light uh, go through. Now, there's a couple uh, takeaways from this. First, in your mind, you can see how when you combined uh, the two different colored markers on the left, you would get an overall pattern that matches what you see on the right. The, the combined visible minus blue and the IR light sum up to pretty close to what you see in a, in a full light uh, replicate of the system but you also begin to differentiate where these processes are happening, right? So some of the cyanobacteria really can use this visible minus blue light to, to perform photosynthesis. You see that they're really relegated to that upper, upper portion of the mat. However, when you look at the IR light, this is light suitable for uh, anoxygenic photoautotrophy. You're seeing that it is, is active just below that upper band. This makes sense. There's less light uh, getting through the mat, it's being shaded a little bit, and we're seeing this uptake uh, uh, in the in just that that second sort of surface of the mat. Pretty exciting because this anoxygenic photosynthesis, we didn't previously know that that could happen uh, during daylight hours in the same way that we're seeing here. So that's uh, an example here from from Yellowstone uh, National Park. Let's see if advance the slide. Okay, now I want to go from there. Um, to another, uh, what I'll call an extremophile system, similar in that most of the energy here is from photoautotrophy, and we're in, instead of looking at hyperthermal uh, system, we're going to look at a hypersaline system, and this system is called Hot Lake in extreme north central uh, Washington. As, as you can see from the picture, calling it a lake is maybe a little bit of an over 
uh, uh, representation. It's kind of a, a, a pond, multi, uh, a sort of lobed pond, but it's extremely saline. And when I say extremely, I mean up to two molar magnesium sulfate is present in the system. But despite that, we get yearly development of a very thick cyanobacterial dominated photoautotrophic mat system. And I say it's cyanobacterial dominated, but there are other, there are heterotrophs, a whole suite of different organisms that persist, but we think they're largely fed off of uh, uh, that uh, autotrophic processes from the cyanobacteria. And we, we did a couple studies on this mat, and we wanted to use laser ablation IRMS to offer some glimpses of where, um, over a daily cycle, where is that carbon taken into the mat, and, and how is it migrating across that depth cross-section? So the first thing that we did, uh, a fairly simple study focused only on bicarbonate, uh, 13C bicarbonate tracer. This is a, a sample of the cross-section of the mat after we've done the laser ablation. There's an upper uh, orangish layer, then green, white, brown, and, and pink underneath. You can see these parallel tracks of different uh, ablation pits. Each of these pits, close to 50 microns, some of them are a little bit broader, a little bit uh, wider across than 50 microns uh, because of how many times we had to hit the mat. But a couple takeaways from this. One, we have an isotope value for each of these pits, which I'll show you in a second. But notice that some of these pits, they're very crisp, right? So on the outside of that pit, there's not much damage that has been done to the sample. We've removed material from within that uh, ablation pit, but have, haven't damaged the sample uh, very much at all outside of that. So here's a look at our results. Apologies, these are oriented a little bit differently than the Yellowstone results that we previously saw. Here we have the delta 13C value on the y-axis. And you know, just a quick word on this delta 13C value again, uh, don't worry about understanding the absolute value here. Just keep in mind that the less negative or the more positive, the number, the more uh, 13C that we're seeing in the sample. And here you can see on the, the x-axis is depth into the mat with the very, very left-hand um, edge of this plot being the surface of the mat and the very right-hand edge being the bottom of the mat. And here you can see that at a time zero, we have the natural abundance, not really any incorporation of that 13C, but then after a half an hour, after an hour, and after two and a half hours, we're seeing this increase in the 13C content focused towards the surface of the mat where supposedly there's the most amount of photosynthesis happening because there's the most amount of, of incident light, incident photons. Now recall that I, I had you look at the, the mat and there's this nice, usually fairly crisp uh, ablation pit. Outside of that, we haven't really damaged the sample. We were able to take that sample after ablating it and then demonstrate uh, DNA extraction and uh, 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 some, some level of sequencing here. And here you can, you can look at the relative abundance correlating to the orange, green, white, uh, brown, and then in the bottom sort of pink of the mat, just as a nice demonstration that after you do laser ablation IRMS, you can still perform other types of analyses on that same sample. So we also wanted to look at um, how carbon is brought into the mat, both from photoautotrophy, but also from heterotrophy. So we use three different types of tracers. One is a, a bicarb 13C labeled bicarbonate, 13C labeled acetate, 13C labeled glucose. And we performed a 24 hour uh, sampling experiment or incubation experiment where we took samples at six different time points over those 24 hours. Now, I wanna walk through these plots. I realize 3D plots are sometimes hard to interpret, but I think it represents the data fairly well. So I'm gonna use the bicarbonate example here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Relative depth through the mat, we're in the back sort of right corner here. That's the surface of the mat. And then as you move towards you, uh, you get to the bottom of the mat. In time, we're going from zero and then further away from you, we get to the 24 hour time point. And I should say that we started these incubations right about midday. So right about sort of a, a solar noon. And then you can see this increase in the, the, the y, whatever, z-axis, whatever you want to call the vertical one, um, is the increasing in, in, a, in 13C amount, increasing amount of the mat that is derived from the, uh, the, the substrate that we put in. So what you see for the bicarbonate is this nice similar pattern we saw before. There's more uh, um, label going to the surface of the mat than the bottom. You see an increase during the day, decrease at night, increases the sun comes up the next morning. 
what you might also be able to see is this carbon is getting deeper into the mat on the second day, showing exchange, probably through met metabolite exchange, exchange and transfer of that carbon from the top uh, down. You don't see the same pattern with acetate and glucose. In these cases, instead, what we're seeing is nearly equal uptake of this heterotrophic carbon across that depth profile of the mat. Um, so running out of time, I want to go on to the third uh, example here. This, uh, in this case, being a rhizosphere example, we have some soil that we harvested from switchgrass pots at the Kellogg Biological Station, uh, not too far away from where I am now in, in southwestern Michigan. And we grew the, the plants in rhizoboxes, and then we then put the entire rhizobox into a larger chamber with a 13C label, label to, to perform the tracer, similar to what Amir showed in, in some of his pictures. And then we isolated a, a root. We did some, some sampling. You can see a visual image here. We then did the laser ablation over that. You can see we targeted in the, the O circles here, we targeted root biomass. And then in the X markers, we targeted a non-root rhizosphere, presumably in this case, because I don't think there's any uh, real soil in this case. And you can see that we quantified the amount of relative photosynthate going into each of these different roots. You know, root D is, is not really growing, not accepting new carbon to anywhere that the degree that root A or, or B is. And we, because we have the IRMS, we can actually quantify uh, the differences in the fresh photosynthesis, photosynthate as measured by that 13C value going into these different roots. We're not after just the roots, right? We can take a sample like this. This is the same image that, that uh, Sophie showed. You can see these different spots. We can look at how much that photosynthate is getting into the rhizosphere in this cases. What we can do is we can map that. So in this particular route, we can see that the rhizosphere carbon extends about a millimeter and a half in the, the three hours that we were doing this, this 13C tracer incubation. So to sum it up, I showed you a few different examples. Uh, cases where we've used this really highlighted that hopefully highlighted some of the benefits that you can get by the spatial analysis using laser ablation IRMS. And I want to just sum it up by saying that our spatial resolution, again, is about 50 microns to 100 microns, depending on the sample. But what, what we have up next is John Cliff is going to talk about uh, some of the, the capabilities of the nanosims, which can, can take us to a much finer uh, spatial resolution than that. So, so, John, I will hand it over to you at this point. Hello, everyone. I'm going to try and get through this pretty quickly since we're basically out of town, uh, out of time. There, I got control. I think. There we go. So I'm going to discuss very briefly the strengths and weaknesses of nanosims and some of the things we've been working on here in terms of sample preparation. So this is a cross section of a Ceteria root. The idea was to, to see if these bacteria, these bacterial colonies would break down an N15 and carbon 13 lab labeled auxin derivative, um, auxin analog, and to see if uh, the plants would then up, uptake the, and get the carbon or nitrogen label. And although the experiment wasn't successful in determining specifically if, if the bacteria were responsible, we can see that um, these bacteria out here are labeled to about 13 atom percent. And even all of the, all of the uh, plant cells are also labeled. So a brief video to describe something. So this is this is a molecular simulation. It's from the Penn State group back um, in 2003, they published this. And I just wanna make some, some points. So the that was a, third, that was a uh, buckyball that was hit the silver lattice at 10 kilovolts. And you can see that it's a very surface oriented technique. We're going down maximum about 30 nanometers. We're changing the surface. We're implanting uh, our ion into the into the surface, and we get both molecular fragments and atomic fragments out. Now, what is analyzed or what is ionized can be put into a mass spectrometer. And on the left here is the nanosims instrument. We have the primary column, 
the sample sits here. Uh, the, the primary ion beam hits the sample and it's accelerated into a magnetic sector mass spectrometer, and then we can collect up to seven ions simultaneously. So some of the nanoseven strengths, I just said that we can collect up to seven isotopes simultaneously. Uh, some common isotopes that are, are done with nanosims are deuterium, carbon-13, nitrogen-15, oxygen-18, and sulfur. And um, all the elements are accessible from hydrogen to uranium. And we can measure sub-picogram amounts of analyte. In other words, we, we can actually detect femtomolar quantities of of some substances. We get a useful pixel size of about 100 nanometers, and a, a typical size of an image would be less than 50 microns. And then we can also sometimes correlate between isotopes and other elements to see if, say, your carbon-13 enrichment is correlated with iron or similar things to that. Limitations, it's labor-intensive. That image that I showed of the plant root, that was more than a full day of analyses. We we have limited molecular information, so we just see mostly atoms and isotopes, or sometimes we measure uh, just uh, diatomic molecules. Our rises for work is really limited by sample preparation. Right now, we're, we're, we're working on that, um, but we have micron scale topography problems that causes some instrumental fractionation. So we actually get a different number than we expect in the isotope ratios if the samples aren't prepared properly. And it's really hard to get that contiguous root rhizosphere interface when we're doing our sample preparation. Accuracy and precision are fundamentally limited by the numbers of ions counted. So you need, up. Oh, this didn't come out. That should be 10 of the six. You need about a million ions of the less abundant isotope, that would be the carbon-13 or the nitrogen-15, to reach one per mil precision. That's that's like a universal law. You can't change that. But um, we are currently detecting less than 200 per mil enrichment of carbon-13 and N15 in a single microbe. So that's both good and bad. If you have a, a fairly robust enrichment, you can see it in a single microbe. Uh, but it but it has to be at least, I'll say, more than 100 per mil enrichment to see it. So uh, this is a study we're currently doing. Um, we're extracting microbes from cores that were uh, injected with either carbon-13 glucose or carbon-13 starch. These cores came from um, the Arctic in the Svarbald region in Norway. And we can see that um, we can detect carbon-13, we can extract the bacteria and detect carbon-13 in single microbes, but it's very, very uh, labor intensive. So after a couple of days of analysis, these are all the number of microbes we got, and there's less than, less than 100 microbes there total. So we've been working on that, and we've got a, a system now where we can, these are all individual microbes, this is a secondary electron micrograph. And these are the analysis craters. And so in, in less than a day, we can interrogate about a thousand individual microbes, give or take. And here we can see these are some diazotrophs. They were fed with N15 labeled dinitrogen gas. And we can see that there's some organisms that are pretty close to natural abundance and some that are up to 75 atom percent N15. Um, so as far as localization of carbon-13 and 15N in root cross-sections, again, we're, we're limited by our, by our sample preparation. This, this all looks cool. This is like a really pretty optical micro, or I'm sorry, secondary electron image. And these are analysis craters from SIMS. And the point is that these might only be 10 to 20 microns thick, but that's really quite thick for, for nano SIMS to get the right answer. Nevertheless, if we look at the edges of the plant cell walls, we can see some enrichment. And the interesting thing here is that we can see enrichments that are very localized that you would never see with IRMS. So they can see 
a few per mil differences in bulk samples, but we can see um, higher enrichments in very small quantities. So this is a, I believe this is a 45 by 45 micron image and we're seeing enrichment in just parts of the cell. And um, because I am stressed for time, we're going to do it that quickly, but I'm certainly open to questions. Thank you, John, and thank you to all the presenters today. Um, yes, we are running a little behind on time. Um, so I think that we have um, maybe one moment uh, for a question. <laughs> so if all the speakers could come back on and turn your cameras on, thank you. Um, okay, so we've had a couple questions come out, uh, but I think the one that just came in is probably the longest. So I'll start with that one as our one our one and only. Um, so it looks like it's from uh, Vini um, Malhotra. I apologize if I've slaughtered your name. Um, and uh, they say, hello, thanks for these awesome talks. I'm generally very interested in tracking the flow of new uh, photosynthate carbon through roots and eventually figuring out how much of this carbon makes makes it into methane emissions. My general question is, which techniques of the ones that you have shown is best for situations with many samples? My ecosystem has a lot of variability and so a large sample size would be ideal. I have to hop off for my next meeting soon, but here's my email. So um, I, I don't know if you could answer that real quick uh, before we leave, if anybody can. <laughs> I think we're all kind of gun shy because there's a lot, a lot going on in that question. But oh. lots of lots of analyses would be one of the IRMS techniques. They're talking about measuring gases. Um, so that would be having a headspace that's controlled and you're measuring the methane in the in the gas space. So uh, clearly nanosims is out. <laughs> um, I don't know, Sophie or Jim, do you have an opinion about that? I, I think I agree with you, John. It seems like the elemental analyzer IRMS uh, has fairly high sample throughput. So for looking at that tracer through the roots and maybe some of the soil or something like that, it'd be great. And then if you could capture some of the headspace gas You'd probably want to do GC IRMS to separate the methane from other gases and then put that methane in the in the IRMS after combustion to get a nice isotope number. Yeah, so, we just would probably want to, you know, be a little more limited in the number of samples that we chose for that method or or know the concentration that we're working with. So we can do an auto sampling type of method. Yeah. Okay, well, I believe this is it for us today. Um, again, thank you to our presenters. Those were some really awesome presentations and thank you to everyone who attended. If you put an email or if you put a question in the chat, um, our presenters will email you back um, and answer your questions. So, um, and uh, if you were able to capture the emails, then you will, uh, you can always email our folks directly as well. So thank you everyone. Have a great rest of your Wednesday.